There we go. Welcome, everyone. I am super excited to host uh, Dr. Jean Gordon from University of Iowa today um, as an ongoing part of our Focus Aphasia interactive events. Thanks very much to Jean for being here and chatting with us. Um, I'll let her introduce herself in a bit more detail, but I wanted to give a, um, just a few announcements. We've got a two-part workshop coming up uh, with Dr. Julie Hangst, and then we've got um, an early career researcher who's going to talk to us about her project. That's Carla Chinoweth. Um, she's been working on the Luna project, which is ongoing over uh, in the UK. So some exciting events coming up as well. As you know, um, we post everything on YouTube afterwards, so feel free to check those out, and they're also archived on the website. Um, if you want a letter of attendance marking your attendance here today, I know a lot of the state associations are requiring the letters for kind of ongoing licensure and they have to be live events. So if you need that, I put my contact information in the chat. So just feel free to email me after uh, and I'm happy to get that to you. Um, welcome to keep your videos on. I generally turn mine off just because my Wi-Fi is a little questionable sometimes and it reduces my bandwidth, um, but you're welcome to keep them on or off. I think that is all of my announcements. So with that, I will turn it over to our talk by Dr. Gordon. Thanks very much for being here. Thanks, Bree. I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jean Gordon and I'm an associate professor at the University of Iowa where I've been for 20 years, give or take. Um, and my main area of research is language production in aphasia and in typical aging. And then, so I study the two main topics are fluency in those populations and, um, and word retrieval. Um, so I'm gonna talk today about um, my COVID baby. So this was when we shut down last spring, I was stuck at home um, with a big pile of data and and so this was a great project to do. Um, I had previously done a couple of projects looking at um, predictors of fluency with my colleague, Sharice Clough, who I think is here today. Um, and that was a different project than the one I'm presenting today. That was specifically looking at predictors of fluency, whereas the factor analysis is more, a little more agnostic in the, with where the goal is to try to identify what are the important factors of spontaneous speech. But in the process of publishing those two papers with Sharice on fluency, we had a, a, one of our reviewers who was pretty adamant that we should be doing a factor analysis. And so that was one of the motivators behind this project. So the project was, other than that, was motivated by um, the idea that spontaneous speech is really the gold standard uh, for um, understanding aphasia. The, the um, syndromes of aphasia vary most on dimensions of spontaneous speech. And, um, and it's also the most ecologically valid outcome. So what we really want to know is how individuals with aphasia can perform in connected speech tasks. Um, because of the complexity of spontaneous speech, that's one of the things that actually makes it highly ecologically valid because um, structured tasks like naming and, and repetition don't really represent the type of difficulty that somebody might have when they have to generate words and combine them into sentences and superimpose the um, prosodic contour, phonologically encode it, and all those things that interact during connected speech. Um, but the complexity of spontaneous speech also creates problems. It, it, there are so many dimensions that are involved that it means that that there's huge amount of variability in performance on connected speech tasks, not just across aphasia subtypes, which is diagnostically helpful, but also within aphasia subtypes. And that variability within subtypes is one of the, the origin really of one of the other motivators for this task, the idea that classic aphasia syndromes have been criticized uh, justifiably for their um, variability. 
the fact that these categories are very fuzzy, they've been described as, you know, having fuzzy boundaries, meaning the, the characteristics overlap a lot, and there's as much variability within a syndrome as across syndromes. Um, and that creates problems for really um, the, the conceptual validity of, of the categories and using them to predict things like neural substrates. So one of the other goals then is to see if there's a more objective basis for classification based on patterns of spontaneous speech. So there have been previous factor analyses done in the literature, and many of these were conducted as a way of um, assessing the validity of comprehensive aphasia batteries as they were being developed. So one example is, I think, in the second version of the Boston Diagnostic Aphasia exam, Good Glass and Kaplan conducted a factor analysis and identified um, seven factors that broke down by, yeah, seven factors, by, um, by modality. So when, the, when factor analyses are based on um, a wide range of language tasks that, that cross modalities, the factors do tend to break down by modality, as this one did, auditory comprehension, reading, writing, and then there are usually additional factors within the, um, the modality of, of uh, spoken language because there's so much variability within, um, within that modality. So this one uh, broke down into repetition, fluency, oral agility, and paraphasia. So we're most interested then in factor analyses that specifically look at spontaneous speech. How does that break down? Um, and there have been others that restricted the analysis to spoken language production, uh, but factor analyses have fairly, fairly um, rigid um, criteria. And, and so many of the previous studies were limited in that they had too few subjects or too few variables to really represent the range of uh, variance in spontaneous speech. Another um, problem of previous research has been the reliance on ratings. So rating scales are subject to subject subjectivity. Um, they can be subjective measures, although I have to say that this um, study by uh, Casilio and colleagues, so a, a Stephen Wilson study, um, they did a really nice job of establishing that the ratings were reliable. And ratings, I've used ratings before, they can be um, with sufficient training, they can be certainly made to be more reliable. But one of the other problems that I've also experienced in my research when I use rating scales is the problem of halo effects. So when you're trying to identify different dimensions, this can be a problem because um, halo effects means that when you rate somebody at a certain level on one scale, that tends to bleed into how you rate them on other scales. And so it becomes more difficult to separate out uh, distinct dimensions. So we wanted to address some of these limitations in the current study by identifying factors underlying spontaneous speech and aphasia using a wide range of objectively measured microlinguistic measures. So I wanna acknowledge some of the limitations of my own study up front, we did only focus on microlinguistic measures, no macrolinguistic measures like um, coherence and cohesion of, of discourse. Um, and we we're able to do this in a large and representative sample of individuals with aphasia. Um, and the goal was, uh, a second goal was to investigate the relationship of the factors that we identified to traditionally defined aphasia subtypes. And we used two methods for doing this, a supervised classification method, which was linear discriminant analysis, and then an unsupervised method, which was latent profile analysis. And I'll explain these a little more uh, once I get to them. So this study was made possible by the fantastic resource that is Aphasia Bank. Um, 
and we wanted to include as many of the individuals, uh, of the English speaking individuals with aphasia as we could. So at the time that we pulled the, the data out of Aphasia Bank, there were 307 unique in the individuals with aphasia. And we excluded um, one person for whom English was not their first or dominant language. Um, eight people who did not complete the um, Cinderella story retelling tasks that we were using, and another 24 who did not produce enough spontaneous speech in that task. So we ended up with this sample, 85 individuals with anomia, 88 with Broca's aphasia, sorry, anomic aphasia, 88 with Broca's aphasia, 42 with conduction aphasia, 11 transcortical motor aphasia, 20 Wernicke's aphasia, and 28 um, individuals classified as not aphasic by Western aphasia battery scores or NABW. Um, so these are people who scored above the, I always forget, I think it's 96.8 um, WAB AQ score that um, technically according to that uh, test means that they have no residual aphasia, but of course it's been established by Davida Fromm and others that they do have remaining difficulties, especially in spontaneous speech. Um, these, this group ranged um, in aphasia quotient, their severity level from 13 to 99 with a median of 75 and ranged in time post onset from one month to 30 years with a median of four years. So fairly diverse group. One thing I should mention about the sample, which is another limitation, is that there's, you'll note there's nobody with uh, global aphasia. Um, and in fact, the more severe, the, the people with more severe Broca's aphasia were, um, most of them were excluded for this reason. They did not produce at least three spontaneous utterances. And so it is a little bit skewed towards the milder end. Um, and that's an artifact of looking at spontaneous speech and needing a sufficient sample. Um, so from aphasia bank, we gathered um, 19 microlinguistic variables that um, during the story retelling task, the Cinderella story retelling task, and we wanted um, to we wanted a set of variables that really covered the gamut of the way in which spontaneous speech can vary. So we had um, two narrative level measures, of total utterances and speech rate. We had a number of utterance level me measures. So these are things that are measured at the, at the level of the utterance, coded at the level of the utterance or they, or they describe a characteristic of utterances like mean length of utterance. Um, and 10 word level measures including if people don't know what this is, this is a moving average type token ratio, which is um, a measure of lexical diversity. So in addition to representing these three different levels, um, we also wanted to make sure that our measures represented uh, three different types of um, functioning, grammatical formulation, lexical retrieval and phonological formulation and implementation. Um, and you'll see that uh, some of these measures like uh, speech rate and total utterances, repairs, um, could represent any of these functions or more than at least more than one of these functions. Um, And um, in addition to representing different levels, different domains, these measures also represented different ways in which um, spontaneous speech can break down. So the, many of them represented accuracy, some specificity or diversity, some complexity, and some represented efficiency of production. So it was important for us to have um, a wide variety of types of breakdown represented. 
So we started out with these 19 variables and in the process of generating the factor analysis, two of them fell out because um, they did not show sufficient um, relationship to the other variables. Uh, they showed what's referred to as poor factor ability and those were noun marking and semantic errors. So in all, we ended up with 17 that, that went into um, the analysis. And with, with the, um, the 17 variables that gave us a subject to variable ratio of 16, um, which is sufficient for a factor analysis, the uh, minimum is generally given as five and sometimes some people say 10. Um, so this is how we address the previous problem of not enough um, not enough subjects in the in the sample. Okay, so this is the first result I want to show you. It's nothing to do with the factor analysis yet. It's just a it just shows how each of the six classical syndromes uh, performed on average on these seventeen variables. Um, and of course, there's a lot of variability that's not represented in this graph. You'll see that later. Um, but if you, if you look at the different syndromes, you can see that the, they are um, distinguished from each other in predictable ways. So for example, if we look at these measures of overall fluency, speech rate and MLU, you can see that the fluent categories up are differentiated from the non-fluent categories here. Broca's in transcortical motor versus Wernicke's in pink, um, not aphasic by Wag in green, conduction in red, and anomic in blue. Um, and I, I keep this color coding throughout, if um, so hopefully that'll make it easier to follow some of the graphs. Um, also, if you look at, uh, this is a measure of circumlocution combined with empty speech. You can see that Wernicke's aphasia produces a lot of, of um, that's a characteristic of Wernicke's aphasia. Same with the measure of jargon compared to the other syndromes. Okay. Um, so then we come to the factor analysis um, and we made uh, some very intentional decisions of the, the um, type of method we were gonna use. We did a factor analysis rather than a principal components analysis, which was different from some of the previous research. And um, the main difference here is that the, the factor analysis only captures shared variance across the the variables, whereas a principal components analysis attempts it or does account for all the variants, including error variants or noise variants, which um, we were not interested in. So the, the goal of a factor analysis is really to identify underlying or latent factors that account for, um, that contribute to the variability in these um, these overt speech measures that we included. It's not to partition, partition up all the variants. And as Wilson and Hula have discussed in their paper, this is the appropriate method factor analysis um, when you're interested in the theoretical underlying factors. The other thing we did, which is different from most of the other research out there, is we used an oblique rotation rather than an orthogonal rotation. And the main difference here is that the oblique rotation does not assume that the components are going to be, that are identified, are going to be uncorrelated. Whereas a, an orthogonal rotation, that's what that means, is that the components are going to be um, separate from each other, not correlated. And I'm sure you all know that in, in measuring dimensions of spontaneous speech, there's a lot of intercorrelation. And so um, we wanted to allow that, allow the, the components to be correlated with each other because um, 
we felt that was a better representation of, um, of reality. Uh, so here's the intercorrelation chart of all the uh, variables that went into it. And for the most part, um, the intercorrelations are, are small to moderate. We didn't want to have a lot of redundant variables. Um, but you can see that there were a couple of variables here that show very low correlations with all the other variables. And these are the two that I mentioned earlier semantic errors and noun marking. And because they're not correlated with any of the other variables, they um, did not contribute to the factor analysis and that's why they were excluded. The, the criterion we used was no intercorrelations over 0.2. Okay, so the next problem in a factor analysis is to decide how many factors are appropriate. And there are lots of different criteria that can be used. Um, one method is to use what's called a parallel analysis, which is what we did to generate this spree plot. And what that does is it compares the obtained eigenvalues for the different factors. And this is when all, all of them are included um, to randomly to um, eigen eigenvalues that are generated by random resampling um, of the data. And so this red line represents randomly generated um, eigenvalues for factors and the blue line represents what we obtained. So you can see that the first six are above that randomly generated line. And so those are the ones that we, we kept. Um, and the factor analysis generates um, two possible um, matrices of results. And I'm going to show you both of them, and then we're going to focus on one of them. So one is a pattern matrix, which basically shows the unique variance for each of the factors. Here are the factors that were generated here. Um, and I'm going to explain them in the next slide. Uh, but th these are the names that I gave them. You'll see why in a minute, uh, hopefully. So this is the unique variance that's accounted for by each of the six factors for a total of 52% of the variance in this, the um, spontaneous speech measures that we included, 52% of the variance was accounted for. The structure matrix shows the total variance accounted for by each factor including any variance that overlaps between the factors. So that's why these numbers are higher and they can't be added together because some of the variance that's accounted for here is uh, um, overlaps between the factors. So it would be double counted or triple counted. Okay, so the, so six, the, the optimal solution, which was based on on this parallel analysis, identifying six factors, but also on the um, interpretability of the factors, um, generated these six factors, which together accounted for 52% of the variance in the spontaneous speech measures. So here's what the, um, here's how the factors loaded on each of the original variables. So the, um, we have two matrices, the factor pattern matrix, which again shows the, um, the unique uh, loadings, unique variance of each factor. Um, so this is, these are um, partial, similar to partial correlations, um, but because of the, because we used an oblique rotation, they're not exactly partial correlations, and so they're not constrained. You can see here, they're not constrained to be less than one, but don't let that throw you. They're similar to partial correlations. So if we look at this factor, we can see that um, what, what it loads on is utterance length, propositional density, which is the highest loading, content function ratio, um, some negative loadings on error production, type token ratio, grammatical errors, and bird marking. Um, 
and I put the highest loadings, those over 0.4 in bold, which, um, and these are the ones which most identify what this factor is representing. Um, so I wanna talk about this factor a little bit because it's maybe the least intuitive of all of them. I call it phrase building because um, it combines dimensions of um, lexical diversity. So the type token ratio here, um, propositional density and um, what this measure is, um, it's a measure of the production of propositions, so ideas that are formed by combining words. And the way that it measures that is by counting um, words that combine with nouns. So it does not count nouns, but it counts words that, that combine with nouns to create ideas. So primarily verbs and adjectives. Um, so the, the heavy loading of propositional density, type token ratio, and verb marking um, indicated to me that this really represents the ability to combine words to make ideas. So a basic level ability to make phrases. And um, it also correlates somewhat weakly, but uh, with um, utterance length, um, and has a negative relationship with content function ratio. So phrase, build, phrase building is enhanced by being able to produce more function words relative to content words. Okay, most of the other factors are relatively straightforward. So grammatical complexity loaded onto utterance length and are two measures of grammatical complexity, the extent to which um, the, the proportion of embedded clauses that occurred and then complexity ratio was really a different way of measuring um, uh, embedding in sentences. Next factor represents semantic anomalies with the heaviest loading on jargon production, but also unrelated word errors and neologistic errors. So in the previous versions of factor analyses that we conducted, um, Semantic errors, which you remember were excluded as a measure, they did not load onto this factor and or with did not load with these variables. Um, and that was somewhat surprising, but it illustrates that the um, production of semantically related errors is quite a different um, process than the production of semantically anomalous or unrelated errors, which are represented here. The next factor is grammatical error production with the heaviest loading on our utterance level measure of grammatical errors, but also um, morphological errors and um, uh, content function ratio and propositional density. The next factor is narrative productivity. So this is um, the ability to produce more words more quickly. So the, it loads onto total utterances and speech rate. Um, and then the final factor is repairs, the um, retracing and, and um, repetition of utterances. And that's a measure in aphasia bank, so that's the heaviest loading there, but it's also negatively related with, to speech rate, indicating that more uh, repairing slows you down. Um, so just a, a technical note, um, the original variables are considered to be the, the um, behaviors that arise from the underlying hypothetical factors, these things that we identified. And so when we talk about them, we talk about, um, about phrase building, predicting or um, loading onto utterance length rather than the other way around because these are considered to be the underlying processes that give rise to these different behaviors. All right, so this is the factor pattern matrix, which is helpful to look at because the um, unique variance um, shared between the different 
factors and the underlying and the sorry underlying factors and the variables um, help identify these factors. Um, this is the structure matrix. You can see a lot more loadings and cross loadings. Several variables like MLU cross load on all the factors. Um, and that's because this, remember that this matrix represents um, total variance, not just unique variance. And so you're seeing all the overlapping variance between factors. And that illustrates that this first factor, as is often the case, is um, really to some extent represents severity because it it's, has associations with most of these other most of the original variables. Okay, so then what we did was generate factor scores for each individual and factor scores are weighted estimates based on the scores that each participant got on the, the original variables and the association of each variable with the factor. And so for each individual, a score is generated on each factor based on all the different um, variables that contribute to it and how they get on those variables. So uh, from here on in, we're only using the um, factor scores that were generated from the structure matrix, the one that allows for, um, that, that illustrates uh, all the variance that's shared across, um, across factors. Okay, so each individual gets a, a score on every factor. What this graph is showing then is the average of the factor scores for each uh, aphasia syndrome. So we get a profile of factor scores for each syndrome. And um, that you can see now that there's a lot of variability within um, the factor scores on the factor scores within each syndrome, but you do see some characteristic patterns. So for example, in Broca's aphasia, we see the um, low scores on the so-called fluency um, measures. Um, oh, I meant to say, so let me just go back briefly. Um, so I think one of the things that I think is a takeaway from the um, these, um, matrices is that there are really two levels of fluency. So what I'm calling phrase building is really a, a fluency at the at the basic phrase level, the ability to combine words into basic units. And then there's fluency at the narrative level. So the ability to put lots of words together and produce them um, relatively quickly. So here we see those two factors represented. The, uh, the green is the phrase building, and then the blue is the narrative production. And um, the Broca's aphasia, uh, individuals in the Broca's aphasia group are low on both of those. They're also low on the grammatical complexity measure that's shown here. Um, and they're relatively high in the production of grammatical errors, the orange bar here. So, my cat always shows up at Zoom meetings. Um, and here's transcortical motor aphasia, which has a similar profile in the low scores, uh, the low fluency scores, phrase building and narrative production, but without the significant um, uh, grammatical errors, the increase in grammatical errors, and with um, without the very low scores on grammatical complexity. Conduction aphasia is characterized by more than average repairs. It doesn't have a very um, distinctive profile, conduction aphasia. Uh, it's one of the limitations of just looking at spontaneous speech to, to characterize the syndromes, but they did produce more repairs than average. Only the, There were only two of the syndromes that did that. <clears throat> 
Wernicke's aphasia, as you might expect, is characterized by high productivity, narrative productivity, um, but with a high degree of semantic anomaly shown in the pink, but lots of variability there. Um, and, and the lowest number of repairs, which is also not a surprise. They're not, um, often don't monitor well, and so they're not um, fixing their own errors. People with anomic aphasia, were, that was the other group, conduction and anomic that showed a higher than average um, degree of repairs. Um, and otherwise low on the, the error scores, the grammatical errors and the semantic anomalies and um, above average on the, on the um, phrase building. Not so high on narrative production so that the fluency at this level is disrupted by um, having by making a lot of repairs. And the final category, not aphasic by lab, um, looks very similar in profile to the individuals with anomia, but better. So lower scores on the error dimensions, so fewer grammatical errors, fewer semantic anomalies and higher scores on the, the other dimensions, higher grammatical complexity, higher phrase building, and higher narrative productivity, and, and the, um, fewer repairs as well. So eyeballing the syndromes shows fairly good correspondence to what we would expect from the classic syndrome labels, but lots and lots of variabilities, variability across uh, within the syndromes. So the next step then is to examine the correspondence between back, the factor scores in the syndromes statistically. And we did that with the linear discriminant analysis. So what a linear discriminant analysis does is it looks at the linear combination of variables that best predicts a certain outcome. And here, the variables we use, the input was the factor scores, the factor structure scores and the output is the syndromes. So this is um, labeled a supervised classification technique because the outcome is predetermined. Where unlike the next um, classification approach that we're gonna talk about, here the outcome, the outcome is um, already specified and it's the syndrome. So how well do the factors predict um, the syndromes or together? What, how well do the, does the combination of the factors predict the syndromes? So this is what um, is generated from uh, linear discriminant analysis. It shows the probability of each speaker belonging to the specified aphasia subtype. And so in this confusion matrix, you can see the correct classifications down the middle here on the diagonal and on the off diagonals are the incorrect classifications. So um, the, just looking at the correct classifications, you can see that the most accurate groups, accurately classified groups were Broca's aphasia and anomic aphasia, 77 and 78% accurate um, respectively. And these were the two largest groups, if you remember, 85 and 88 individuals in these groups. Um, and for, and so they were most accurately identified, but they were also over predicted. So the predicted, um, the, what the linear discriminant analysis classified was more than they actually were. Uh, so there were 88 individuals with Broca's aphasia and the linear discriminant analysis found 91, which is uh, uh, over 100% of the number that actually were there. And so if you look at the off diagonals, you can see uh, which types of aphasia were classified um, erroneously according to the, um, according to the um, clinically, clinical classifications um, into other classified as Broca's aphasia so transcortical motor and conduction aphasia, anomic aphasia were more likely to be um, classified as Broca's aphasia. 
Um, and so again, looking back at the, at the accuracy, you can see that transcortical motor aphasia was um, the least accurate. The linear discriminant model did not classify anyone with transcortical motor aphasia. Um, and conduction aphasia was also very poor. Bottom um, square here shows overall classification accuracy. So all uh, the, out of all of the individuals, 61% were correctly classified by the linear discriminant analysis, which is not particularly high. So looking at some of the, um, the off diagonals, you can see that the, um, the, the um, most frequent error for uh, um, Broca's aphasia was being classified as anomic aphasia, having anomic aphasia. And um, those with transcortical motor aphasia were most often classified as having Broca's aphasia or um, anomic aphasia. Those with conduction aphasia were most often classified as having anomic aphasia or Broca's aphasia. And those with Wernicke's aphasia, the most frequent error was conduction aphasia or anomic aphasia. You see a theme here. Anomic aphasia was the most common error was Broca's aphasia and not aphasic by Wild, the most common error was anomic aphasia. So if you look across, you can see why these two large categories were over predicted. And essentially what the model is doing is saying, is looking at the variance in the, in the scores and seeing the, the dominant patterns of Broca's and anomic aphasia and over predicting those. And so particularly anomic aphasia, which was 144% um, of the actual number were classified as anomic aphasia. And so it's, it's almost like the model's treating this as like a default category. Okay, so then um, before we leave the linear discriminant analysis, I, I wanted to see how these misclassifications that we were just looking at compared to misclassifications of, uh, compared to disagreements between clinicians. So. I didn't tell you this before, but aphasia bank contains subtype diagnoses generated by two different means, um, generated from the, the Western aphasia battery scores and also generated from clinical judgments from the individuals who submitted the data or who, or who tested the individuals by whatever means they typically use in the clinic. And looking at those two classifications, there were disagreements on uh, 63 or 23% of the individuals in the set. And 55 of those involved comparable types of aphasia as in the um, linear discriminant analysis. So I wanted to see what the, how the distribution of clinical disagreements compared to um, the misclassifications in the linear discriminant analysis. And that's what's shown here. So the two um, pie charts show the confusions in the linear discriminant analysis and the, um, the disagreements by clinicians. And they're similar in many ways. So um, both of them tended to um, confuse anomic and Broca's categories. Um, that there were also some differences. So um, the model was more likely to confuse uh, conduction and anomic aphasia compared to clinicians. And clinicians were more likely to confuse conduction and broke, what, what did I say? Conduction and anomic in the model and conduction and brocas by clinicians. So there were some differences here, um, but many of the other uh, um, types of confusions were similar across the two. Okay, so that brings us to the last classification method a latent profile analysis. So maybe the problem um, of the linear discriminant analysis, the, the problem of linear discriminant analysis had was trying to, to fit um, categories into these pre-existing fuzzy syndromes. So 
what about an unsupervised classification method where the, the categories of individuals are not constrained by some predefined um, outcome? So latent profile analysis is a kind of cluster analysis um, in which the nature and size of the groups is unknown or unassumed. So we didn't want to make any assumptions about the nature or the nature of the groups or how many belonged in each category. So this is quite comparable to conducting a factor analysis, but the difference is that here we're focusing on looking at um, the underlying shared variance among the individuals where the factor analysis looks at underlying shared variance between the measures, the spontaneous speech measures. So now we're focusing on classifying individuals into broad categories. And to do that, um, you, the latent profile analysis can generate multiple models. Um, because we didn't want to make any assumptions ahead of time about the number of groups, we tested um, anywhere from two to 10 profiles, solutions with anywhere from two to 10 profiles, um, and making different assumptions about the variance and covariance of the data. And then all these model solutions were compared against e each other by different um, criteria. And the best fit generated seven profiles. So these were the different profiles um, on the factors. So, um, and, and I have given them labels um, that are based on the characteristics, the, the profile that they show on the different factors, as well as uh, who went into it, which I'll show you next. So as you can see, the um, latent profiles capture some of the variability that is, that is um, similar to the classical syndromes, but with some important differences. So the first profile is probably an important, um, the, the clearest example. It combines uh, characteristics of Wernicke's aphasia, the, the high number of semantic anomalies with characteristics of Broca's aphasia for performance on the, um, on the uh, measures of fluency, uh, which is odd. It's not something that is intuitive from the point of view of a clinician, I think. Um, other profiles are a little more intuitive. So this is a non-fluent profile that combines um, better performing individuals with Broca's aphasia and transcortical motor aphasia. This profile looks like in, uh, the lower uh, performing individuals with Broca's aphasia, so lots of grammatical errors and lower um, scores on the fluency measures and grammatical complexity. This one looks very similar to the anomic profile. This one look, also looks like a cross between the anomic profile and the, those with who are judged not aphasic by Western aphasia battery. This one looks similar to the Wernicke's profile, but not as severe. And the final one looks similar to the not aphasic by well profile, but better on um, on the fluency and grammatical complexity measures. So to summarize what this type of analysis seems to be doing is it's capturing some of the qualitative differences between syndromes, but also paying a lot more attention to differences in, to quantitative differences in severity. Here's a, a look at who went into each of these profiles. Um, and this is one of the, the, the ways that I, I used to decide what to call them. Um, so the first one, for example, low Wernicke's, high Broca's shows 16 individuals with Broca's aphasia more than half, but also for individuals with Wernicke's aphasia. Um, this is probably one of the clearest examples showing almost all individuals with Broca's aphasia and a few others. Um, this is one of the least clear examples, which I call high Wernicke's because uh, there's a significant number of individuals with Wernicke's aphasia, but 
also almost equally divided amongst um, three other types. Um, so this, the latent profile, latent profiles that were generated by this analysis did not show a consistent relationship to subtype diagnosis. Each included at least four subtypes and um, each aphasia subtype was represented in at least three of the profiles. Um, and I think the reason is what I said earlier is that it's paying much more attention to quantitative or severity differences. And the, these were verified by looking at what I called high and low brokers. I looked at their performance on WAB-AQ and some of the other measures and they were significantly different. So to summarize all those different analyses, the exploratory factor analysis generated six factors that reflected um, both fluency both at the phrase level and at the narrative level, grammatical accuracy and complexity, semantic accuracy and repair behaviors. Those are the, the factors that distinguished amongst the syndromes and accounted for 52% of the variance, which um, is quite a high number for a factor analysis. As, uh, um, but it leaves open questions about the other 50% of the variance. What else contributes to um, patterns of spontaneous speech? And there are lots of um, possibilities such as pre-morbid style, um, individual differences, both pre-morbid and in how they um, adapt to the stroke. The linear discriminant analyses um, generated correct subtype classifications for only about 60% of the speaker, speakers and uh, mismatches were similar to those shown by clinicians. And the latent profile analyses reflected both quantitative and qualitative variance in generating profiles, dividing several of the syndromes into higher and lower performing sub subsets. So uh, the factor analysis did offer a glimpse into broad patterns of production in aphasia but one of the takeaways, one of the things I take away from this is that the, the um, factors are just as prone to fuzziness as the traditional syndrome. So they're not really a solution to the problem of fuzzy boundaries between syndromes. The methods of generating a factor analysis are only as objective as are allowed by the um, selection of variables and participants that are included. So very dependent on number of subjects, type of subjects, number of variables and type of variables that are included. Um, and the statistical approaches that are used to, to look at uh, classification are also sensitive to um, different sources of similarity and, and variation in clinicians. And the, the biggest difference being the influence of severity. So two things, the influence of severity, which was evident in the latent profile analysis and the influence of the large groups, which was most evident in the linear discriminant analysis. So the solution of the linear discriminant analysis was very influenced by the high number of brokers and anomic aphasics in the group. So what this points to in my mind is the need to balance this kind of data-driven population level analysis, which can only capture broad patterns to more fine-grained individual analyses. And it also generated a lot of follow-up questions in terms of the um, individual differences within these different syndromes and the role that um, might be played by different types of discourse and other types of variables that were not measured here. So lots of room for follow-up. Oops, can't skip over my thank you slide. So many thanks to the um, ASHA Foundation for whose funding contributed to this um, and to the Aphasia Bank developers, administrators, and all those who contributed um, including the clinician researchers and the patients who allowed their data to be stored there. Um, thank you to my mostly anonymous reviewers for JSLHR. 
and to Dr. Stark and Focus for inviting me. And if we have time, I would welcome questions. Fantastic. I will um, let some of the questions roll in, but I just wanted to say huge thank you. I find this fascinating, as you know, <laughs> and so I'm really glad you came uh, to chat with us today. I guess I should turn my video on so you can see me. Um, so I will, I will let some people think of some questions, but I guess I'll kick one off uh, just to get us kind of going here. Um, you know, one of the things I think is fascinating with uh, treatment is measuring outcomes and kind of looking at what outcomes, you know, would theoretically change with the treatment. And something I like about this factor analysis approach is you kind of come to the table with the idea that you do understand there's lots of interactions between microlinguistic variables and whatnot. Um, do you think, you know, having this kind of a global overview can help us to you know, identify treatments maybe a little bit more clearly rather than basing them on kind of aphasia subtypes, just having that like idea of how things interact. I don't know if that's too global of a question, sorry. It is a big question, but I have some ideas that have come out of this study and the two previous um, studies with, uh, with Sharice Clough um, that relate to, um, so don't directly relate to the data that I showed you, but just but relate to the data that uh, that kind of emerged from this, and 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 that has to do with the interaction. So one of the observations was that the the impact of a given variable depends on syndrome and severity. Mm -hmm. So one example um, is I actually do have a slide that illustrates this kind of busy, but um, I did conduct some correlations of the factors across uh, of the factors. These are the factors with certain variables individually for different um, mm -hmm. uh, subtypes. And the one thing I want to draw your attention to is the role of uh, repair. So uh, repair in some syndromes is positively related to narrative production. So this is for Broca's aphasia, mm -hmm. but for um, Wernicke's aphasia, strongly negatively related. And what does that mean? So that means that if you can, <laughs> well, your dog has an answer. If you can repair, um, production, then that's really helpful to somebody who has very limited production to begin with. But if you do a lot of repairing, it's not productive for somebody who's already quite fluent. It actually reduces fluency. So the impact, another, another um, example was finding positive correlations between grammatical complexity or MLU and grammatical errors. So producing more speech or more connected speech actually created opportunities for more errors. And so there's not always a predictable relationship between good types of good characteristics of spontaneous speech and bad characteristics of spontaneous speech. And so that has to be considered at a more micro level, either syndromes or levels of severity or individuals even. So what becomes important really depends on the profile of the individual. Yeah, I always find repairs interesting because it's a level of self-awareness too, which can be, you know, interesting. Right. Um, I will stop taking all the question times. I'm sure there are others on here. So um, I know we have one in the chat. I don't know if you can see the chat, but I'm happy to read it out to you. Uh, let's see. So as a linguist, I'm a little unfamiliar with types of tasks uh, in the aphasia bank and therapy approaches. So forgive me if the question is off. Um, might the reformulation task be playing an important role? Like would real life, real life conversation be a better source? And would the categorization of types of aphasia benefit from also looking at how speech is co-constructed with interlocutors? I think I read that okay. <laughs> yes, that's an excellent point. And, um... And conversation is really a completely different beast from narrative, I think. Um, and that's a limitation of this study is only considering those microlinguistic variables, not macrolinguistic variables, which would include um, types of interaction with a, with a partner 
um, I intentionally chose the narrative though, for the reason that it, uh, it controls to some extent the um, content of the narrative. So if you're looking at conversation or even the personal narrative, as opposed to story, story retelling narrative, um, there's a lot more difference that can be introduced in terms of how much one says and, and the topics that one addresses. And I, I think that's going to introduce variability that um, makes it harder to compare across individuals. Um, I'm not sure what the question about for reformulation. I think possibly like the, the role of maybe memory um, in terms of like semantics rather than episodic. I might be misinterpreting. Yeah, me. that's an interesting question about the role that uh, memory might play. There were some individuals with aphasia, and I, I bet Davida can give more insight here, who seemed not to be able to perform the task because they didn't seem to be able to remember what happened in the picture book that they that they reviewed. So there's more going on there than. All right, and maybe one. I final. see hands up. Oh, here we go. Yep. Rachel Ostrin, former student. Good <laughs> to see you. Hi. Hi. Uh, blast from the past. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I actually had a question that was um, related to the one that was that was just asked. Um, and was curious about um, even if you still do monologue speech, um, what you think about different types of spontaneous speech elicitation tasks. So um, retelling a story or, you know, the cookie theft, like those are very, they're very structured because there's not much deviation, right? There is a limited number of things in the picture. There is, you know, a limited number of events that happen in Cinderella. Um, and so I wonder if you think how you think that a, a more unstructured, just kind of open-ended question prompt, you know, where would you like to travel or something like that um, might, uh, how that might work as a better way or, or as a different way of kind of separating different subtypes um, because that would that allow for more variability um, in terms of kind of types of responses or, or even specific and content responses. Um, it's kind of what you think about that in terms of a different task. Yeah, that's kind of hard to predict. That's an interesting idea. And there has been some research conducted mostly by Heather Wright and her and her colleagues on the role of different types of, um, of elicitation tasks. Um, but it could be it, it could be a way of enhancing distinctions between subtypes of aphasia because um, some individuals with aphasia can take better advantage of the open-endedness of open-ended discourse. So they can work their, like individuals with anomic aphasia can work their way around word retrieval blocks by circumlocuting. And whereas individuals with um, uh, Broca's aphasia have less ability to do that. Um, so it's it's possible that it could, but um, I, I think for this, those are sources of variability that I was more wanting to factor out. I think they're very important ecologically, but um, I just kind of wanted to control them in this study. Very reasonable. Thanks. Um, I think Dr. Fromm had a question. She raised her hand, so I just wanted to ask. Yeah, hi, hi. hi, hi. This is so great. Um, and thank you so much for, uh, for doing this work and, and then for explaining it so clearly, just laying it out um, in such a, in, in, in such a you know, clear fashion, going through the various steps and processes that you did um, makes so much sense. Um, and it's, I think it's a really important thing that we need to sort out and we now you know, have the have you know some data with which to do that, and have you know interesting new uh, statistical methodologies and things that we can apply. and And I think it's a very exciting time for this kind of research. and And I know it's it's um, an area that you've been 
looking into for a long time. Um, I guess um, one of the things I just am curious about is how, how you feel tied um, to the syndromes when we're talking just about connected speech, um, because we do run into that issue with repetition and um, auditory comprehension being such integral parts of the syndrome definitions and the syndrome realities, perhaps, you know, if they are. Um, and so if we're just talking about connected speech and specifically even microlinguistic aspects of connected speech, does it still make sense to hang on to like transcortical motor when that's really like a non-fluent with, you know, good repetition and repetition is not relevant in connected speech or, you know, with the uh, auditory comprehension aspects. I just, I, is that a disconnect for you or you just think we should forge ahead that way? Just wondering what your thoughts are about that as you, you know, we're playing with your um, results and still relating them to high and low yeah. Um, types. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's a limitation in a sense that um, it's, it's sort of the only gold standard I have to try to understand what's going on is to always go back to those syndrome um, labels and see how they correspond. I don't really know how to understand the, the, um, the categories that were generated without that. But, and, but it's also a limitation to only rely on spontaneous speech. I do think that spontaneous speech is the major source of variability. It's what's behind the fluid, non-fluid dimension, which of course, you know, I'm interested in that. Um, I think it's a major contributor here, um, but it means that something like, we didn't have very many transcortical and they were only transcortical motor. So I think they were fairly well accounted for in at least in the sense of capturing their non-fluency but lack of you know, grammatic a grammatism. But the conduction aphasia group was not well captured. I think that's probably because they're distinguished better by repetition. Um, but one thing that was captured for conduction aphasia was the issue of repair. So the, yeah. And, and I think that some of the things that were captured here, and we've talked about this before, point to ways in which it would be helpful to come up with more fine-grained distinctions. So what kinds of repairs um, would be helpful to notice, to distinguish between conduction and anomic, which were both high on that. And what kinds of um, grammatical errors would distinguish between agrammatism and paragrammatism and things like that. Um, so maybe, maybe it would do a better job if we could get more fine-grained, but of course you're right that the, the classical syndromes make use of the other auditory oral modalities as well, yeah. And it looks like we have one yeah. final chat question. I don't know if you can read that on your end. Is it possible that the evidence pointed to brokers as a default because the narrative does not include much auditory comprehension info? Um, I, I think Broca's and, and Omic were, were identified as defaults because there were so many and their characteristics on the spontaneous speech um, identified like those two broad patterns most clearly. Um, if you mean not having auditory comprehension info, info would make it certainly make it difficult to distinguish between Broca's and global that's what you're thinking of. Any other questions? Great to see some former students here. <laughs> I see it a lot. Sorry for the beagle. Julianne, Cherise, Ari, hi. Lots of lots of people here. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gordon. We will uh, we'll put this on YouTube and we'll send the link around as well and. Sorry about the beagle interruption. She saw a squirrel, so important. <laughs> um, classic. But <laughs> thanks so much. And uh, if anyone has any further questions, I will uh, relay them to you. But to everyone who's here, if you need a letter, please send me an email. My email should be in the chat.
Um, and if uh, Dr. Gordon allows us, we might post her, her slides on the website too, we'll see. Um, so thank you all for joining us and we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.